Oh, it was a beautiful day, a great day. They had so much fun. They had cotton candy. They had fresh fudge. They had popcorn that just dripped with butter. And it was a day that they would always remember the best family day they had as they walked the Pier 39 of San Francisco. Oh, the sights they got to see. They saw the sea lions hanging out in the water upon the floating pontoons and the wood. And they saw clowns. They saw the, the Ferris, no, not the Ferris, the, the carousel. And they saw all the shops. They saw the Hard Rock Cafe. They saw Bubba Gump Shrimp. They saw all these different shops along lining the whole pier. And they saw street performers. They saw people playing music, pouring their hearts out into their passion of what they loved. And they saw other street performers, you know, those ones who pretend to be statues. Gold, silver, those type of street performers where you go up to them and you do everything to try to get them to break character. You get up to them and you start snapping, clapping, saying, ha! trying to get them to break their character, and they are so locked into what they're doing that they don't break character, except for maybe a moment to readjust and change a pose. For the young boy watching for the very first time, he almost had thought that this was a real statue. Mom, Dad, look at it. It's a silver statue, and there's a gold one. There's one that looks like a robot, and there's one that looks like a man. And he would go up to them, and for kicks and giggles, the street performers would move. And the boy would jump back. And as the day came to a close, the whole family started to exit Pier 39, and as they made their way back to the parking garage... They were walking along the, the sidewalk next to the pier and next to the harbor where the boats were, the smell of seaweed and fish just permeating the air. And as they were going, the little boy needed to throw the, the, the stalk of his cotton candy away. And so as he was heading towards the trash can, he was making his way, and as he got to the trash can, right before he approached it to throw away his trash, a bush jumped and went, wah! And the boy jumped back scared and everyone started laughing as the boy had met the famed Bushman of San Francisco. I think I was about 10 when I met that Bushman. And it scared the living daylights out of me because you just never know what was real and what was fake. Looks can be deceiving. Jesus, as he started, to, as he continued to talk to his disciples, he was sitting there on the mountaintop and he was talking to his disciples and all those who were listening, the audience, and he had just spoken and we had just heard last Sabbath of how Jesus talked about the narrow gate and the road that leads to life and how few are that find it. And right after Jesus talks about the narrow gate, Jesus gives a warning. Matthew chapter 7 is where we're going to be looking today, verse 15 through 23, if you'd like to follow along. Jesus gives them a warning and says, beware. Beware of false prophets. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Jesus, when talking about the kingdom of heaven, in talking about the road in which his followers would go towards the kingdom of heaven, the greatest warning that Jesus could give them amongst all the dangers on the road to the kingdom of heaven, even among persecutions, the greatest warning that Jesus gives his listeners to his followers is that of false prophets. He says, beware. 
Beware of false prophets who come to you looking like sheep because they're clothed in sheep's clothing. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. He's giving this description. He says, listen, along life's journey, as you choose to follow me, there are going to be dangers and there will be snares. But the greatest danger that you need to be aware of as you're on this journey towards the kingdom of God are those who pose to look like me but really are not like me. They look the part, but they don't act the part. And sometimes, maybe people really do act the part really well, as we'll see further. Look at this. He says, but I'm going to give you a way in which you can recognize them. And Jesus shifts from the animal kingdom and shepherding to agriculture. He gives a very simple illustration. He says, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit? A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. I love fruit. I love food. I'm a huge foodie. If you haven't tell, could see it tell by now, every sermon illustration that I probably have come up with involves food. I love food, and I love fruit. Some of my favorite fruits are raspberries and blueberries, but even more so, pineapples and mangoes. And I remember a couple years ago while I was in college, I had the privilege to be able to do literature evangelism work. And one of those years, it took me to Hawaii. Two years that I served as a literature evangelist, I got to serve in Hawaii, teaching people how to go door to door. And we stayed at the local churches, and we would sleep on floors, we would practice there, we would worship there, and then we would go out into the streets to knock on people's doors and try to tell them about Jesus by sharing the books that we had to offer them. And I remember one morning as I was getting up in the morning before everyone else, I sat there in front of the church in the morning, the cool of the morning, and I looked across, and across from the church there was a Hawaiian cemetery. It had gates all around it. All of the tombstones looked the same. They were black, and they, they were off, off, uh, off bounds for us to go and tread on, on the, the cemetery. Actually, King Kamehameha, uh, one of the Hawaiian kings, is actually buried there, the family. And as you look at this, this cemetery, there is something peculiar about it. I noticed there was a tree, a big mango tree. And as I looked at that tree, I thought, that tree is so out of place. Because it's right across from a church in a cemetery that's gated off, and no one has access to the mango tree. It was full of fruit. There were mangoes full, filling the tree, and they were just falling to the ground, and some of them were spoiling because no one could reach them. And I thought, wow, that is amazing. I wish I could have one of those fruits. And I wish I could have access to get to that tree because I would harvest that whole tree of all of its mangoes. And I would share with the rest of the group. But I just thought it was so unusual. Of all the trees that they would place in a cemetery, they would put a mango tree. There wasn't a very lively bunch there. No one was going to eat them. And for the whole summer we were there, we hardly saw anyone go over there except for the groundskeeper. And even then, he didn't even eat the mangoes. And I thought, and I pondered this tree, and I thought about the fruit upon it. And I thought about how many times fruit within our lives, they are representing of something. Many times when we look at the Bible, especially within Galatians 5, we see that the fruit of a tree is representing the characteristics of an individual, the fruit that bears forth from someone's life. And it's the results of what the roots have been absorbing. And I thought about this tree and how trees, those that have fruit, the fruit is not to be kept to ourselves, but the fruit is to be shared with others. If we keep the fruit to ourselves, it does nothing but rot. 
So you could be a good tree and bear good fruit, but if you do not share that fruit, then it spoils. Jesus says there's healthy trees and then there's diseased trees. I remember just recently as I moved, we have two hibiscus plants. And one of them is beautiful and healthy, and then the other one, uh, unfortunately, the pot cracked in the, uh, in the event of the move, and, and it's always had problems. And I noticed just recently, a couple of weeks ago, that as I had watered them and tried to get them to come back to life, there was a little something growing at the base of the tree or the flower bush. And as I looked at it, it started to resemble a mushroom. It was a little yellow mushroom. And I started researching what this little mushroom was, and it's actually pretty common amongst the different plants within household plants. And these plants um, grow these mushrooms as a result of contaminated soil. And they start eating the, the waste, the organic matter that has been there that was once healthy and that has died. And I started to consider that in, as I was preparing this, this sermon, and I thought about, wow, how crazy is that, that this is growing as the result of the contamination of soil? Trees can be healthy or they can be diseased based upon the soil they are planted in. What is the status of our heart's soil? As our lives continue to bear fruit, Galatians 5 tells us of the works of the fresh flesh, which symbolize the, the, the works of the flesh and the fruit that is born of that. And then he gives the fruit of the Spirit when God is with, manifested within the life and he shows the fruit of love, joy, kindness, peace, long-suffering. And it's the, the, heart of the, the heart of the issue is an issue of a heart. What is happening within your heart's soil? What is taking place in there that is causing the fruit to bear either good or bad? Let me tell you another story about another, another tree or another illustration that I saw bear bad fruit. I remember... My junior year of high school, you know, young, ready to go, full of life, excited, full of zeal, wanting to live life on the edge. And I'll be honest, I grew up in an Adventist home. You know, my soil was good soil. But somewhere along the way, I spoiled my soil. And that was by personal choice. My junior year, I remember, I, I got into into anything and everything you could think of to turn my heart away from God. I even entered into a relationship that was, was very, very toxic, to say the least. And I remember for that whole year, my whole life and the fruit that I bore was diseased fruit. And it was only by my own doing that this had taken place. And I remember as I, as I lived that life of what I wanted to keep feeding my soil and keep feeding my roots, the fruit kept becoming more and more apparent within my own life. I became selfish. I became disrespectful. I became prideful. I became arrogant. I became you name it. And that was my life. But the thing about living that life was I also became really good at deceit. I was really good at playing the role of looking like that good deacon or elder's child who grew up in the church, and I could get away with a lot. And it drove my friends nuts. You know why it drove them nuts? Because they were the ones running alongside me doing all the crazy stuff, but then they would see me go back into church and just like a flip of a switch... I was the good little church boy again. My fruit was, was growing and growing, and it was getting so big that my life was giving the evidence of it. 
And it came to a turning point because at the end of that one year, what really did it was I had to cut myself off from the things my roots were feeding. And the things that were feeding the spoiled fruit was the toxic relationship, the people I hung out with. And so I ended up cutting off this relationship with this girl that was really no good for me. And I cut off the friends who were no good for me. Those who were the influence that kept leading me away and way to bear the fruit that I was bearing. And I started to change. But it was a change that I needed to come to for myself. And it was the result of many prayers that my parents had been praying over my life the entirety up until that junior year and even more so. I will never know how much my parents ever prayed over my life during my junior year. They knew everything, but they never said anything. They continued to love me and, and to hold me close until the day that I decided I was going to turn around. The love and the consistency of which they were bearing upon my life was that which changed mine. Their prayers transformed my life as I, as I cut free. Now, I wish I could say from this point on in my life, things were perfect. They weren't. As I continued on, even past my junior year of high school into senior high school, I, things got better. They did. But then college came, and I wish I could say things were perfect, but they weren't. I still had my own personal struggles where God was still taking the soil and turning it because my roots were so deep into the things that I wanted that it was spoiling the fruit. And so God had to take me and break me Time and time again, even, even now to this day, God goes through a breaking and he goes through a turning process where he churns my soil so that I can produce better fruit. And he's telling us, guys, on this road to the kingdom of heaven, the greatest thing you have to worry about are false prophets, people who look like Christians, but they don't act the part fully, and you can tell them by their fruit because they're leading people away from my kingdom by disregarding my word. It's not a hard test. Jesus says you will know good and bad. You can see the fruit because the tree will only bear It's right fruit. Verse 20 says, Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Ultimately, the character is the fruit which reveals all. But even more so, more than even false prophets, people who appear to be godly and to appear to preach the word of God, to do great signs and miracles, I think one of the greatest false prophets is the one that we face in the mirror, where we think we can fool ourselves with how well we're living this Christian life, with how well we can get away with doing what we want while showing up to church and maybe putting up an act for everyone except for God, because God is the one who sees the heart. Look what Jesus continues to say about this. Because he doesn't really give a clear description of who the false prophet is. But look, in verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? These are Christians. These are people who are already in the church. These are Christians who are proclaiming to be like God, to look like God, to walk the part just like Jesus. And these are no ordinary Christians. I mean, these are almost super Christians. I mean, when's the last time you perform an exorcism? When's the last time you did a mighty deed? I mean, these people are 
are super Christians. They're the ones who say, Lord, Lord, we taught in your name. We also cast out demons. I can't remember the last time I cast out a demon. The closest I came to was when I was in India, my senior year of high school, and we went on a mission trip, and every one of the leaders, even the leaders of the school, had a call to go to this young girl who was in the dorm who was possessed by a demon. And we all prayed, but us younger kids were not allowed to go. That was the closest I ever came to an experience where, I, where someone cast out a demon. I've never done that before. Mighty works. I mean, the closest I can kind of think of a mighty work, maybe miracles of people being healed. But last time I checked, I never had my, sh- my shadow heal anyone when I walked by. These are people who, who walked the part, but yet in the end, Jesus says, I never knew you. He says, beware, because these people are even going to pop up, not only now, but even at the end of time. You remember Revelation 13? Another false prophet comes onto the scene doing great signs, even calling fire down from heaven, healing people. An entity that tries to mimic and imitate God's presence, but yet is a false teacher, a false prophet, one who uses coercion to try to get people away from the one true God and to bring them away from the true worship of God. Check this out. Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Or some translations say lawlessness. The Word of God says that the transgression of the law is lawlessness. Probably the best fruit that you could ever see or test within whether or not someone is rightfully of God or not, we're told is obedience. Obedience. Obedience to God's commandments. Yeah, that sounds like we've heard that a thousand times, right? But no, really, look at the fruit of our own lives. We can't keep the commandments really that well in and of ourselves, really. I mean, maybe we could do keeping Sabbath holy, right? Uh, Maybe we could honor our parents, right? Maybe we're we're really good at not committing, uh, killing anyone or, or stealing. Maybe we're good at those things. But James says if you've broken one, you've broken all. says, I never knew you, not 50 years ago, not 20 years ago, not five minutes ago. He says, I never knew you. Obedience is the true fruit in which we see is a true disciple. 1 John chapter 2 says this. He says, and by this we know that we have come to him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Those who play the role of Christian but sow seeds to lead people away from the observance and the true obedience to God's commandments are false prophets. The character, the characteristics of self-interest, the characteristics of selfish gain, the characteristics of wanting to pursue our own points, our own opinions, while disregarding what God has for us. And you see that is even the, the characteristic of in Revelation chapter 13 of the false prophet is the prophet wants to usurp True worship to God through corrosive worship, leading people away from the observance of God's holy day, which is in essence the worship of one's life to God. 
The Sabbath is not just a day. The Sabbath is a, is a day in which reflects our life and how we live with Christ every day. Did you know we can enter into the Sabbath rest every day? The Sabbath is just the pinnacle of that experience in which we're learning to rest throughout the whole week. I feel a little beat up, don't you? That was a little heavy, huh? I could, I could really keep on going and going and going about how bad we're at keeping the commandments, and I could really keep on going about what a false prophet looks like. Where's the hope in all this? The hope in all this is that Jesus is giving a warning out of love, warning us that along this life, we're going to have people who are going to try to derail us, and people even within our own church who are going to try to derail us, and even more so, beware of our own self-deception. Because we may think we're walking a really good walk when really we could be the furthest away from it. Remember Jesus said in the verse prior to this, verse 14, few are those who find it. We can only find it by the leading of Jesus. We can't keep the commandments except by the help of Jesus. Zechariah gives a story. Chapter 3, it says this in verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. We're given a picture of a high priest, someone who is godly. And yet he's dressed in filthy rags and look at him. Satan is accusing him before the Lord and he says, the Lord is standing by and the Lord, look what Jesus says. It says, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments and the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, Behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. I want you to notice something. Throughout this whole encounter, Joshua said not one word. Only the angel of the Lord and Satan spoke. But through it all, even though Joshua was standing there, filthy as he was, guess what Jesus did for him? He took his filthy garments and he gave him new, clean garments. The way that we're able to bear fruit isn't in and of ourselves. It's through the power of Jesus within us. Jesus takes the filthiness and he takes the spoiled roots of our life and he touches them and he transforms them. The greatest miracle that we could ever witness within this life is the miracle of a life transformed as Jesus has been hid within it. One in which walked a road of lawlessness and now walks a life in obedience. And don't get me wrong, it's not obedience just to be saved. No, we, we keep the law of God as a result of being saved. It's the fruit, the fruit of love. Because we love Jesus so much, we want to do the things that pleases Him the most. And the only way we can do that is if we abide in Jesus. John chapter 15, Jesus says, if you abide in me, I will abide in you. That is the key to bearing fruit. That is the key in which our trees 
our lives can bear the, the character of Christ, the mystery of godliness, which is Jesus within us, is when we abide in Jesus, He is the one that transforms our lives to reflect His image. It's always been about Jesus. It always will be about Jesus. Looks can be deceiving. We can play a role really well. And we may pro prove to fool a lot of people even within our homes and within this own congregation, but we're not fooling God. Because as it is God himself who reads the heart. Abide in Jesus day by day. What does that look like? It just simply lives a life in constant communion with Jesus. Yeah, it can be reading the Word of God. Yeah, it can be praying. But come on, if, if our life, if our religion was consistent of works, life would be a so much easier. But in reality, our life is a life that just lives to be in the presence of God. And from our life will spring the natural fruit as evidence of the Holy Spirit living within you. Jesus, I just want to ask that we wouldn't just strip everything. And even when we can't strip anymore, I pray that you would take the rest and strip it off of us. Jesus, please do the work that we cannot do ourselves. Form the character. Take the spoiled fruit and take our lives and produce fruit, the fruit of righteousness. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.